Hey everyone, what's going on? My name is Stephanie Graham. I'm an artist and filmmaker, and I'm also an extremely curious person. Some will go as far as to say that I am nosy as a fuck. The nerve. <laughs> I started this podcast because I wanted to interview people. I'm not just talking to anyone either. I'm talking to people who are in the thick of what they do. I want to know how they live their life and how they get things done so that I could apply some of their savvy to my own life. I'm sharing this with you so that you too can do the same. We can do it together. We all got to start somewhere. And if you're not looking for practical info, stick around anyway, because my guests are fascinating and it's my goal to get to the bottom of their shh. I mean, aren't we all just a little bit curious of what it's like to live someone else's life? And if we do it the same? There are also times when I will feel called to catch up with you one-on-one -on -one and let you know about what's going on with me, either in life or with my art practice. You didn't think I'd get the dirt on all these cool people and not let you know what's going on with me, did you? I mean, I'm a Libra. We believe in balance. Listen, I am a big believer that even though we are all different, we can still find ways to relate to each other. It's time to get down to business, so welcome to the Nosy AF Podcast. Hey there, welcome back to the Nosy AF Podcast. If this is your first time, welcome. If you've been here a while, welcome back. So today is a very special episode because today's conversation is one of, with my very, very, very good friends, Christina Anthony. I thought it would be fun to talk to Christina about comedy and share her ideas on how we could be funnier because, well, let me just like, tell you about Christina and then you'll be like, oh yeah, okay, she could totally talk to us about comedy. So let me brag about my friend Christina. So Christina is a multi-talented actress, writer, vocalist, and improviser. And she is originally from the Chicago comedy scene and is best known as an Emeritus Company member of the Playmakers Lab, which, fun fact, Christina was recently awarded the Storyteller of the Year Award. Yay, Christina! Um, she was awarded this by the Playmakers Lab, and it was a really fun night, and it was really tearful. Also, it was so emotional to see my friend on stage accepting her award. So that was a really awesome night. And Christina is an alum of the Second City ETC Chicago, where she co-wrote three award-nominated sketch reviews and performed thousands of shows for Chicago audiences. You guys, Christina just has awards, 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 okay? <laughs> Most recently, though, Christina was a series regular on ABC's Mixedish, which is a spinoff of Blackish, and she starred opposite of Kristen Bell in the Netflix dark comedy series The Woman in the House Across the Street from the Girl in the Window. Woo! <laughs> What a title. Um, this spring, she made the move to NBC, though, to appear in a lead role in Non-Evil Twin, which is a sitcom pilot created and starring Amber Ruffin. So I can't wait for you to hear this conversation with Christina. I know I probably say that all the time with like all of my guests, but I'm just an excited person. So I'm always like, I can't wait. I can't wait. But I probably need to calm down. <laughs> but I still can't wait for you to hear this conversation with Christina because after you finish here, you might want to binge out on some of the projects Christina has appeared in. So some of her favorite camera roles uh, like as an actress include The Rookie, The Rookie Feds, which is on ABC, Keenan, which was on NBC, Key and Peele, which we all know Key and Peele, Mashup, Comedy Central, and Bunked, which was on Disney, and Why Women Killed Paramount+. Plus. By the way, how many streaming channels do y'all have? Right now... You know, I don't even really want to tell my business because, you know, y'all don't don't tell people who what streaming channels you have because y'all might not be paying. I may not be paying. It's nobody's business. So I don't even really know. I shouldn't even ask that question. <laughs> I should go back and edit this out, but I'm not gonna. Listen, we can go on and on and on about the accolades and where we've seen Christina, but then we will probably have to have a whole new episode because all those accolades will take up one episode. Then you have to hear her conversation. That's another episode. But let's just get into it. I'm very excited for you to speak to the artist herself. So you all enjoy this conversation, please, with my buddy, Christina Anthony. 
Well, thank you so much, Christina, for doing my podcast. Thanks for having me. How are you doing? You know what? I, as, as they say in the theme song from Good Times, I'm keeping my head above water, making a way when I can. That's right. Temporary layoffs. <laughs> Good times. <laughs> That's right. Temporary layoffs because we are recording this in the middle of the writer's strike and we are both. Do you identify as a filmmaker? I do. I know you're an I, Do you also identify as a filmmaker? I don't identify as a filmmaker, but I call myself, you know, I'm a career artist. Yeah. I, my, my number one vocation is making new things. Ooh. So yeah. Yes. Yeah, so my household is participating in the strike. We were on the line, the picket line this week. Thank you so much for doing that. I feel like, I really feel that the film industry needs to start from, like they need to just start all over. I don't know how we've gotten to where we are. But I think back of like, you know, MGM and all those guys like working in their suits and they had to be home in time for dinner. I'm just like, clearly these folks were making a living. They were able to have a balance in life. Like, what is the problem? Yeah, I think sometimes, especially these on-camera art jobs, screen art jobs, you know, they're just so highly coveted. And I think over time, yeah, the the people that actually bring you the shows and the movies you love are not people in suits. Yeah. <laughs> they don't actually do the work. The work is done by the person who sets up the lights and the person who gives you your your dinner while you're shooting, the person who drives the truck, the person who cleans your toilet in the trailer while you're getting ready. Like these are the people that make television and movies and those laboring jobs. I think right now what we're experiencing is like the working class. It's all of us versus the people in suits who, yeah, they don't literally, they do not do heavy lifting. Appreciative for the check writing, but let's start writing better checks. And I think that's what we're fighting for right now. Absolutely. I just feel like the whole thing is just not kind, period. It's just not nice. And it's yeah. like, give everybody what they deserve, what they want, and let's get back to making TV. Let's get back to making movies and let's create and give people more opportunities to create. It's just really, really infuriating. Yeah, it's hard. It's you know, again, it's hard backbreaking work for many. I mean, as I'm, I perform as an actor, obviously my work is not backbreaking. It's long, but it's not backbreaking by any means. There's always a seat for me. So I'm not about to pretend as if like I'm doing something very difficult or strenuous, but the writers are the first people that are striking right now. And that's literally where all of this starts. Like there's no Marvel movie. There's no Netflix there's, you know, none of this content that you love or going back and being able to watch like your favorite reruns of different shows. None of that stuff happens without the writers. The studios and the executives don't actually think of those ideas. They don't flush them out. They don't, they don't do that. They, again, provide money for them to be made, but we need the writers. That's where it all starts. And so because of them being on strike, I'm very proud. My husband's currently on strike and I'm very proud of him. Yes. But after that pride goes away, my landlord would like to know. <laughs> okay. I appreciate your pride. I'm not able to apply this to your rent. So we're going to need them to come up off that money and run, yes, run these people run their money, what they deserve. It's They've earned it. Absolutely. Absolutely. So you're a comedian, Yes. Comedian. Is that, is there, okay, so in comedy, there are different, like, are there, you know, like in the art world, there's different art worlds. Are there different comedy worlds? Oh, yes. Yes. There's, there's the stand up school, which I think is probably the most dominant and gregarious part of the comedy world. You know, those are the, I think they're the, just like the most flashy. And not every stand-up is flashy, but I think stand-up itself, the bravery 
to go out there and just be doing comedy by yourself. Mm -hmm, Um, mm -hmm. It just takes a certain type of person. Yeah. And then there's the sketch world, which is group comedy, any group of two or more doing pre-written sketches. And then there's improv, which is any group of uh, two or more doing, you know, off, as Nick Cannon would say, straight off the dome comedy. Exactly. That's how you pitch pitch wilding out to black kids. It's straight off the dome. (laughs) <laughs> but yeah, it's it's just unwritten comedy, Nick. You don't have to say straight off the dome, but thank you. Yeah. And then there is another group, which I would call like kind of like this indie alternative. And they incorporate lots of things. Oh, I should say also there's, and then there's like scripted comedy, like people who, who write comedy, but don't ever perform it. So the, okay. those first three are people who perform comedy. But then there's also just the writer of comedy. And sometimes oh. they write stand-up for other people. They write sketch for other people like SNL. But they never appear on camera or appear on stage. Some people ghostwrite comedy for mm. other people. Like Richard Pryor was very famous for having people that wrote his jokes. And he, he was just the performer of them. Oh, no way. Yeah. Oh, so many people. So many people do this. Wow. Yeah. And it's great. I think I want to say... Chris Rock definitely was a writer of stand-up for someone else before he became, you know, a name on his own. But yeah, and then you have like, yeah, that that fifth group then is like this kind of independent performance comedy artists who, you know, they might have like props or they sing, you know. And sometimes I fall into that category. I like to be in that category, which is like kind of alternative comedy. Sure. Experimental. It be live, experimental, mm-hmm. yeah. G- or being in like musicals, like you're just a comedian that they've, they've clearly put a comedian into this existing work of art. You know, horror films, sometimes you'll, you'll, you can figure out like, oh, that person's a comedian. Sure. And so yeah, well, that's a way to perform comedy as well. And then throughout all these art worlds, everyone can still identify as a comedian. Well, no, there's a battle. I mean, to some okay. people, yeah, yeah, there's a battle. Everybody, I, I feel like sometimes people feel like, no, what I'm doing is more, is pure comedy. Mm, mm-hmm. Yeah. So, so stand ups, you know, I came, I definitely learned in learning how to do improv. And then I did trans, uh, trans, transform, I trans, uh, transferred into stand up. And so I started doing tr- stand up. And stand-up is it was pre-written bits that you rehearse over and over again. You take them in front of an audience, you try them again, see if they like it. You know, you got a bit, y'all, last week's family reunion was crazy. How crazy was it? And you see, like, how many punchlines and they see how much they love it. Improv, you would do that bit to say, like, hey, I got a joke about a family reunion. But then you never come back to it ever again. It disappears into thin air it just and so whoever was there that night if they love that joke girl i love that joke about the family reunion great thanks but you'll never see it again because it was just straight off the dome yeah so yeah so those two art forms i find are in direct competition with each other Mm. because one is saying the same joke night after night after night week after week city after city on the road improv you never come back to that joke you never re-improvise you can't it's never going to be as funny be, is it never going to be as funny because you don't you literally don't remember it or that's the rule like to never talk about it again? I just think you can't. It's something there's a something that's magical about writing on your feet mm-hmm. that also the audience, they also know she's making this up. OK, you know, <laughs> yeah, she's making this up. And I think there is I have respect for both art forms. I find stand up to be quite difficult. Because there are times where I'm like, I don't think this joke is funny. And the audience is going crazy. And then you do it in another place and they're going crazy again. And you're like, ah, it's just okay to me. But the rules of stand-up say you keep it because they they love it. I see. Improv, though, if you do a joke and you don't think it's funny or people think it's or it's not funny. And you they like, I don't like that. I didn't laugh. It doesn't matter because nobody will ever see it again. Hmm. But stand up, if you bomb, oh my God, it's, they're recording you. <laughs> People are coming up to you after like, hey, I got an idea about your joke. Why you didn't get the laugh? <laughs> I'm like, thank you. 
<laughs> yes, like I didn't ask for this to be workshopped. <laughs> Does, is it like that for, for your world? Hmm. Is it painters versus photographers? I don't think so. I do think that painters, I feel like painters have their own world of breakdown. And you know what? There might be photographers might have issues with like iPhone photographers versus Ooh. photographers. I remember when that came out, like you can even see now like on Instagram, they'll be like, I'm a iPhone iPhoneographer. Oh, wow. So there's like different levels, but I don't think that there's any beef. Sometimes there is like if I'm photographing something, Especially, and this is one of the reasons why I hate like doing events and stuff. People will come up like, oh, what lens you got there? What lens you got there? And it's just like, don't worry about it. And yeah. they like want to size size you up by the lenses that you have. But I have a friend that I like work with Canon and they will let me borrow lens. Like Canon will be very nice. Like let me try out lenses. And so sometimes I'll just have to shut them down because it's like, look, this is something you've never seen before, isn't it? So now yeah. go back over there. But I love, but you know what, I, I think, and I believe this is true about the visual art world. When somebody is just funny, though, every comedian of any particular discipline is like, they're just funny. And there's no issue, you know? Yeah. And so when people dabble, I, I mean, to say the word dabble, but when you're like expressing yourself in different parts of the genre, I feel like people are like, you know what? You're just funny and this is fine. If you want to try this or if you're going to stay here, you know, this is what you enjoy. Do you feel like that? I feel like that's true because I've, I've, I've seen some of your work. I should participate in one of your projects mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. it wasn't about the lens. I don't even think you had a camera. I believe we just used the camera at the Kmart. Oh, yes. At Walmart. Photos, yes, Walmart, Walmart photos. Yes. Yeah. Yes. But a true yeah. photographer, it's your eye we're going for, right? It's your yeah. your taste. And we use their backdrop. It was it was hilarious. It was hilarious. It wasn't intended to be hilarious, I don't think. But your yeah. proof, I think it proved it's not all the trappings and how expensive your studio is and the lighting and the camera, right? Yeah, that is true. Now, and that and that's why the problem is like, why do you care what camera lens I'm using? Like, why do you care if it's, you know, a Canon like F2 or F8? Like, what does it matter to you? You really should just be concerned with like what I'm photographing and why I'm photographing it. You know, like that's that's really the interest. And then, you know, photographers always like the good ones. They'll say, hey, the best camera is the one that's on you. So if that's your iPhone, then that's the best camera. If you've decided to bring out your big, you know, bajillion D, you know, long camera, that is also great. Whatever camera you have is the best camera. And as long as you can use it. And that's so true because you'll see, again, these iPhone photographers, they do beautiful stuff. People are making yeah. whole movies with iPhones and these Android phones. Can I tell you my favorite camera? Yes. Whole life to this day. I love a good Polaroid. Yeah. Which Polaroid? Do you have a particular one? Oh, boy. No. The little one. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. The little one. Actually, I've been using one that it's probably around here someplace. It's the one now that it gives the, the pictures are very small. Oh, yes. The like Fuji mini type yeah, thing. Yeah, I've been loving those. And I love, something I love to do is if I'm at an event, I use that camera. And because now I get photographed a lot and I don't always, those pictures, they just all starting to look the same to me. So I like to mm -hmm. like see if I can use my little Instax. And then I also, if I'm at a more casual event, I love to give the camera to a child and say, you know, oh, you only yeah. got 10 in here, use them well. And usually... When I come back to look at the pictures, you know, it's nine pictures of people's feet. But then there's one picture that is really good that I'm like, yeah, this sums up the night. This was a fun, fun little event we had. And thank you for this picture, you know, six year old person. Oh, that is so sweet. Yeah. And disposable cameras and those Fuji's, those the colors that they come out with, they're like rich, but then also sort of muted. Like, yeah, the only problem is, is if you come back to them, like after, you know, like five years later, they're like all mush. 
Oh, wow. That's ridiculous. Yeah, I got to figure out a way. Maybe there's something you can put them in to make them last longer. Oh, yeah. Maybe like a photo album with like archi- archival pages. Yeah. To look into that. I didn't know that about those. That's terrible. Yeah, that part I hate. So everything's like a blur or everybody's 10 shades darker than when you photograph them. But yeah, but I do like it is nice in the moment to like look at them. I think I'm going to do I have a trip coming up. I think I'm going to do a disposable camera for that trip. Yeah, definitely do a disposable camera. Those are those I are feel fun. Like I have no pictures. No actual like physical pictures to hold in my hand. Yeah. And you can also hire, would you hire a photographer to come meet up for the day? That's like a thing too. Oh my gosh. That seems like, like a lifestyle photographer. They're just like documentary photographers say for like 200 bucks, they'll come with you to like the day out while you like explore. Okay. So I wouldn't get $200 worth of groceries that week. I would. No. Okay. (laughs) No. And I value art. So I'll consider this. It's taking my breath away. If you can't hear that people at home. (laughs) Yes, no, listen. I believe in paying for artwork. So we need all I, Yeah, extreme. maybe we'll do that. I don't know. Yeah, maybe. It's just a idea. I heard somebody, give me someone was doing that. Yeah. You know, I was I was hearing somebody was doing that when they had like a photographer show up for a family day at the beach. And I was mm. like, oh, that's such a nice idea. And they just stayed there while they were hanging out at the beach. And now they have photos of like the family at the beach. That's really nice. Yeah. So, hey, listen, how did you get into comedy? Oh, wow. I think I'm just I'm actually been uh, thinking about this lately. I have to give a speech coming up in a couple of weeks. But I believe that you're born whatever you are. Mm. So I believe I was born a comedian. Mm. You know, like you were born a photographer. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And. Maybe somewhere along the way I forgot that. And so each, you know, year of my life, I'm slowly like coming back into that and realizing who I actually am. And some years is more, it's it's stronger for me than others. Mm -hmm. Yes, I am a comedian. And then other, other years, you know, maybe it's not as strong. Like maybe in the seventh grade when I stood up in my chair and said, school sucks because I had seen the (laughs) Simpsons. Not my best work, you know, not my funniest set. And I got in big trouble. Come on. What was your trouble? Do you do you remember what you had to do? I got a spanking in seventh grade. The teacher? No, my mother. My mother. Oh, my gosh. They called my mother. But also I went to like this cat. A uh, private school, Lutheran school. I mean, it was completely off brand. Oh my God, school sucks. Because <laughs> you would think, like, they would just be like, Christina, please sit down. Oh, like, is it needing to, like, call your mom and all that? Like, just tell you to sit down. No, it was a very prim and proper school. <laughs> and, and also, I don't know why I did it. It was so, it was so stupid. It's pretty good. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's, <laughs> It, it makes about as much sense as me doing it now at a dinner and being at someone's house. <laughs> well, at times, Did you yeah. believe school sucks? No, I didn't. You know what? I did not believe school sucks. I was a great student. I was making straight A's. I think I graduated number two in my class. Like I was the, I made a little speech at graduation. No, I didn't think school sucked at all. I was good at school. I had seen The Simpsons after my mother said we should not watch The Simpsons because they don't value educators and education. My mother's a teacher (laughs) and retired teacher now. But yeah, so we couldn't watch The Simpsons. And I think I tried to like watch a few minutes as fast as I could. And that's what I gleaned from it. That was my source material. Wow. Yeah. And then the next day when people were talking about The Simpsons, and they're just like, you can't watch The Simpsons. Get away from our group. I was like, I can't watch The Simpsons. Baby, I watch The Simpsons, baby. Uh- I know about Bart Simpson. <laughs> I know about the mom and her tall hair. You know what? School sucks. Wow. I was, on a, I was feeling insecure. Mm-hmm. And yeah, and I, I, I lashed out. Dang. And everybody, and then you, you're the casualty where everybody's just sitting there looking. And you're the one no in one trouble. No one laughed. 
<laughs> oh my god! Oh, they looked at me like I was crazy. <laughs> That's hilarious. And to this day, I still haven't seen The Simpsons. I really don't know what it is. I just know that it's a little boy who gets in trouble at school. He's always, all of them, they're always getting into something. The whole family's getting into stuff all the time. It's a great show. And I can't believe it's still on. And they predict stuff. They've predicted things that have oh, happened really? in this world. Yeah, they predicted Trump would be president. Oh, my. They just, it's weird. It's weird how that's happened. Perhaps someone is a prophetess in the writing team. Perhaps, on the writing you know. team. Yeah, but. But I know prophetess Anthony, my mother, was like, do, we do not watch that in this house. Man, I got in so much trouble. She was like, you got up there and showed your natural black behind. That's cool. <laughs> oh, my God. That's ridiculous. So wait, does humor, did, so like humor comes easily to you? Because. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Well, you know, sometimes I'll see like comedians, like I've worked on this one. It was like Bill Bellamy's Who's Got Jokes. It was like an American Idol of comedy. Oh. And the comedians around there, some of them are sort of like chill. They'll just wait for it's their time to go up. And then other ones, they just are like making joke after joke after joke. And it's like, Yo, just be easy. Yeah, we call that being on. Okay. It can be exhausting. Yeah, it just seems like it's not necessary. It's like, I don't know who you're trying to impress. It's a bunch of comedians sitting back here, like, waiting to go up and audition. Like, yeah, just sit down and have a juice. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, I treated, everybody has their own perspective on it. Like, Robin Williams, he was a comedian who was famous for always being on. Uh huh. Yeah. My thing is, if you're not paying me and the camera is not on me, I'm probably going to conserve energy. <laughs> yeah. So, like, we had a little pre show meetup before this recording. Sure. And yeah, I was probably on zero drinking my coffee, getting warmed up with you. And then when the microphone came on, the magic happens. The magic you know? is happening. Yeah. But yeah, I think it can be. And also, I think in your real life, I would warn, you know, or, you know, give a little piece of advice to your listeners of any art form discipline that they're in. You, when you, the energy that it takes to create whatever you're making, yeah, conserve that energy. And then in your real life, if you have people that you want to be friends and be around people who will let you be off and rest and still enjoy you. Yeah. I'm sure, like, I don't enjoy people who are like, uh, tell us a joke or, you know, tell us something. You know, it's like, I'm just here to rest and enjoy, you know, whatever we're doing here at this, at this uh, juice bar. You know, I'm not here to do stand up. I'm sure it's annoying to you if somebody's like, can you take my picture? And you're like, I'm just here at the funeral like everybody else. Exactly. To cry. You know, like, yeah. I'm not here to do a photo shoot. So you want people who you can be off off with you can be yourself not performative not engaging in your artwork and resting and conserving your energy so that way when it's your turn you're ready and you're well rested and you look great yeah that's why they have green rooms you know you know that's really what it's for it's a place for you to rest so the audience can't see you right not being you know whoever it is they think you are yeah yeah, I hate that even like of myself, like if I'm chill and like usually you might see me before like laughing and joking. And then if you see me again, they're like, what's wrong? Like you don't seem like yourself. And it's like, I'm just sitting here. Yeah, I'm just being. I hate that. Yeah. yeah. And then people are like, well, usually you're usually this way. And it's like, no, I'm not. I'm usually how I am right now. Yeah. Like let humans be. Yeah. And, and then when you say something you about it. They like get, it's like, then you're being rude because you're like, I'm not acting anyway. You're just being rude. <laughs> yeah. You want or me to be just, a certain way. Yeah. You just wanting too much from me and you're finding out that that's too much and you don't like how that makes you feel. Yeah. But yeah. Go home and examine that for yourself. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. I, oh I had a few gosh. young, not, I shouldn't say young, they're not that much younger than me, but comedians that I 
I'd find myself to be like a mentor too. Mm-hmm. So we had lunch here at the house because we are on strike. So that's right. <laughs> that's right. And you I know what? Home cook home cooked meals are the best anyway. Oh no, I did. It was takeaway, but I used oh. my home plates to make it nicer. <laughs> Yeah, that's definitely nice. You're using your home plates. Absolutely. I get a real fork. My point is, is, yeah, I, yeah, I answered the door in my strike braids, no makeup, sweatpants. Like, we're just, it's just here to be, you know? Yeah. We're not here to do anything else. And, you know, fellowship, lift each other up. Obviously, everybody has their own the strike is hitting people emotionally and financially at different places. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Sometimes when we've been going to the picket line too, like there's been like food there. Oh, that's really nice. Yeah. And there's, it's all kinds of food, you know, it's like, it's pizza, it's donuts, it's water, granola bars, energy drinks, coffee, all kinds of things, but like whatever wow. you need. I needed a coffee one of the days. It was pouring rain, but we were still out there. And I say all this to say, yeah, there's so much that goes into like being an artist, but mm-hmm. the actual minutes that you're performing are very small, but it takes a lot out of you. Absolutely. And you need support in other ways. And so like, even on the picket line, like I've noticed like, I'm like, hey, some people are coming here and they need a meal. Yeah. Thank you to those people that are sending those meals. Yeah. That are sending that coffee. You know, and then like yesterday we had this lunch. That was an it was more of an emotional lunch to help like check in with people's mental health. Wow, that's so thoughtful of you to host a lunch. So nice. And they have always they've been supportive of me as well. You know, I think you don't pay people back for supporting you, but I think I recognize too, like, you know, everybody's art ain't for everybody. Yeah. It's nice when you're in community with people who enjoy your work. Yeah, that's probably only who I want to be in community with. <laughs> yeah. The, who wants to be around people with like, who were like, you know what? I just saw some of your artwork. Let me tell you what you did wrong. I was, oh, I was like, you're exhausting. <laughs> yeah, I don't. I know like people that will say that you're like, I don't I didn't like your work. And it's just like. Okay, because now what am I supposed to do with that? Now, if you have something constructive to say, like, hey, I thought, you know, maybe that didn't come across all the way or you didn't finish your thought this way or whatever, that's better. But if you're just like straight up don't like it, no. Yeah, you're this like self-proclaimed criticism. Nobody asked you. Yeah, I, I really it get I don't mind when some comedians come up to me with thoughts about something like how to make a joke better. I appreciate yeah. that because it, to me, it shows they do believe there's like potential in me or in the joke. Mm-hmm. I, I believe it comes from a really honest and caring place. Yeah. But like regular civilians, that's what we call you guys. <laughs> <laughs> civilians from the audience that are like, oh, I have an idea. <laughs> don't do that. Yeah. We don't like that. I don't like that. I don't Anybody- come to your job. And tell you how to do it. <laughs> okay. Am I telling you how to run this register? I am right. not. You know, like, hmm. Okay, Jackie in accounting. I have some thoughts about how you tally those checks. It's like, no. Yeah. Just let people do their work. And if Just, you don't enjoy it, it's fine. Yeah. Have you ever been heckled or anything? I have been heckled. I, I like to think that I'm very good with hecklers. Okay. But I have been heckled. It's been it's rare. I've definitely been and I've definitely been heckled more, more than, more often as a, in like as a group in a group of comedians. Okay. A stand up as a stand up only not very much. Okay. And I think the way I just shut it down was like, please stop. Yeah. And that was funny enough that people were like, that was so earnest. I'm like, it is. I don't have like any kind of long speech for you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, please, just please stop. I, I have this. But as a group, I can remember, it wasn't even really being heckled, but I can remember one time when I was working at the Second City. Mm-hmm. And that's kind of the bulk of where I got my comedy training for sketch and improv. And 
you do a show for people. It's like a two act show, two hours with an intermission, but they're all also able to order dinner as a group. And at the end of the second act, towards the end of the show, I mean, people have been drinking, they're laughing, it's fun. Maybe there's a celebrity or two in the audience, somebody mm-hmm. like a Chicago celebrity's there. It's everybody's having a great time. You know, two or three hundred people. And then their bills come at the end while you're still telling the the last jokes. Oh no. And It just becomes a thing. And so people try to do it as quietly as they can. But I remember this one group that was more towards the front and they were getting picked up on the microphone. And it was just this group of ladies. Maybe it was like somebody was getting married in a couple of weeks. It was like a girl's night out. And they're just like, well, no, I had a margarita. Well, no, you had a double margarita. I had the cheese sticks. And I'm like, you know what? Please stop. (laughs) And I just was like, I can hear you. I know the audience can hear you because you're so close to the mic. And I literally stopped the the show. It was like, look, I feel like if everybody covers one drink and one appetizer that you had and you leave $25, that's a really nice tip on a hundred dollar bill. Please be done with this. And the audience just clapped, but I just remember them looking at me like, my gosh, it was so disruptive. Yeah. Like, please just be quiet. Are you an enamel pin collector? Well, I don't know if you knew this, but I have my own pin company called Graham Cracker Pins. It's a tiny shop and we make limited edition pins and I got quite a few styles. I have one around the theme of Carrie James Marshall called King Carrie. Another fun one I have is I Need a Baker, which is Anita Baker with a baker's hat. I have a pin dedicated to the Lord our savior, Jesus Christ. There's a couple different styles. And I also work with a lot of independent companies and artists to help them create their own pins for whatever they want. I started Graham Cracker Pins because I was inspired by this one artist making them. And I'm like, you know what? This is a pretty cool way to make my art available at a very low price and still make fun art at a limited edition because you know the limited edition is where it's at. Anyway, I would love for you to check them out. You can go to grahamcrackerpin.co and check them out. And then if you are in Chicago and you check out the Museum of Contemporary Art, I have some pins in there as well. Just want to, you know, plug my stuff. (laughs) Thanks for listening. So going back, okay, so you yelled school sucks. Yeah, that was my first stand-up show. Yeah. How do you decide to say, okay, I'm going to pursue this as a career? Well, yeah, I think at that point I was very much discouraged, Mm -hmm. literally by my mother. (laughs) It was like, (laughs) you on the punishment. And yeah, but I think after that, once I got to high school, maybe a couple of years later, I had an acting teacher who was like, oh, I think you're very good you can be in like a school play. So I was like in a school, school musical. I think she made me like the lead of the school musical. And yeah, I'd always like kind of played instruments. I played like clarinet and saxophone. So I was musically inclined Mm -hmm. and I was, and I was in the choir, but she was the one that was like, Oh, I think you could really do this. And she even told my parents, I think Christina is really good at this. I think this could be a real job for her. Oh, wow. So that was like probably 14 or 15. And so I even did a play, like a local community play. Yeah. In the in the local town. And she would like pick me up and we'd go there. And I did that play. I did a play at school. And so when I graduated high school, yeah, I was, I'm like, yeah, I'm gonna go to school for like acting. And my parents, like many people's parents, you know, in our age group, our parents are the first generation out of segregation. Mm -hmm. So for some people, unlike our, you know, non-Black counterparts, my parents and their siblings, they're some of the first people in their family to go to college. Yeah. They might have even gone to segregated schools or gone to segregated concerts or segregated movie theaters. And so I feel at the time now looking back, they kind of steered me away from art and for going to school for art. You know, because they're like, you need a real job. What will you fall back on? You know, 
And so I went to school. I think I was psychology pre-law. And wow. Yeah. And I, I think I end up I end up changing my minor to statistics or something like that, just so I could graduate. Yeah. And I did like some plays while I was in college outside of the department. But yeah, it was once I graduated from college, I went to Chicago. I had met a lot of friends at U of I in Champaign. And they're like, yeah, we're all going back to Chicago after school. That's where we're from. And so I kind of, there, I kind of just started my professional career. I started acting, doing musicals. And even when I was doing those shows, the director would be like, you're really funny. You know, we'll just stick you in here. But I wasn't like doing what other people were doing. I was learning a lot on the job because I literally, you know, did not have a formal acting degree. And so then I, yeah, I got invited to the Second City to do a workshop. And they're like, we're going to show people like how to do improv and sketch. And I really didn't know what that was. I knew what SNL was. I knew what Eddie Murphy was. But yeah. I didn't know like this is the path to SNL. This is where they find people. Oh, and so, okay. yeah, I did it. And it kind of just unlocked something for me. Like I realized I'm like, oh, being funny in a play or being funny in the classroom is not the same as knowing how to structure a joke how to compose an actual line of dialogue that will make the audience laugh at the end, no matter what. And yeah. so I learned that and yeah, it was kind of, so I guess that was, that was my training, my graduate school. And I, I learned there for like four years. I went on tour all over the world. Wow. Yeah. A lot of, I went to Oklahoma. I went to, to the Dominican Republic. I mean, like we did, I did shows all over the world and you perform like stuff from the archives, like that Tina Fey wrote. And oh, wow. John Candy wrote uh, all kinds of things. And then it was in searching in those archives and doing those shows that I really became interested. I really never had anybody. I felt looking back on their like 50 years of sketches of all these people that go to SNL. I was like, there's yeah. not really a lot of black women. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so for me, it was important once I got the opportunity to start writing sketches and being the author, it was very important for me to leave work there that future comedians that looked like me could see themselves in. And so I wouldn't have to pretend to be like I would play a character that Steve Carell played or Stephen Colbert, but that is not the body and the life that I'm living. Yeah. And so I wrote, I began to really hone my point of view and write sketches and comedy from the point of view of a black woman. Because I'm hmm. a black woman. Yes, you are. Yes. And so, yeah. And I found that, I think that was another thing that just like unlocked in me. I was like, oh, I'm very good at this. I'm very good at just being who I am and using my life experience and being authentic and then applying my comedy in that way. And so I think once I figured that out, I mean, granted, I'm, at this point, I'm getting pretty old, but... It took me a while. You know, yeah, it didn't happen. I wasn't doing improv in high school. You know, I didn't go to college for theater. I didn't go to Harvard and start like writing comedy. And I didn't go to SNL, but I did end up moving to Los Angeles. And I think now I have a very solid sense of what's funny and what's not. I have a very specific point of view. And I love it, you know, now when I projects come across my desk, I'm able to look at them and say, like, do they need me in this? Do they need Christina or do they just need a black face? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's very important to me. Like, I'm not here to, like, be your chocolate chip and the sugar cookie. I heard that because that isn't even good. You no, know, I need you going to get my you going to get my black face. You gonna get my black hair texture. Yeah. My black features, my black mind, my black politics and. Yeah, every comedy and sitcom on TV isn't looking for that. But I was very fortunate. My first job on Mixed Dish, Aunt Dee Dee was very much that type of character. Yeah. She had a strong opinion about interracial or biracial, relate, uh, interracial marriage, biracial children. And a new project I'm working on for NBC, which is shot, is um, a Fortune 500 company. And a woman, she has to take the place of her twin sister and try to help this merger go through. And I play her assistant who's like, if you want to get over on corporate America, let me show y'all how to really do it. Like I've been in corporate America and it's great. It's like about basically about two black women, a black woman helping two other black women try to get over on corporate America. Ooh, and that's exciting. Yeah. So we just shot that before a live studio audience. 
And hopefully you guys will see this in the fall. Okay. Or maybe the spring because of the strike. I know. You know, listening to you talk and share your experience, it just it keeps me thinking about how political our personal lives as Black creatives is. Yes. Others will never understand. No, they won't. I mean, and I, I think sometimes, yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a responsibility. I'm not going to say it's yeah. a burden, but it's a responsibility. Yeah. Right. And I think it's also important too, if you are an artist listening to this and maybe you're like thinking about giving up or you're right, you know, on the cusp of feeling like I thought something was about to happen. I just encourage you to stay with it. Yeah. I came, I think I got my first big TV job at the age of 43. I'm sure mm-hmm. my agents don't want me to say my age, but you know, that's, this is the, it's a testimony though. Like, it's okay if it didn't happen for you in the way you thought it was going to happen. It's okay if it didn't happen as quickly as you thought it was going to happen. But you staying in the game, there's somebody watching you. You don't even know it. Who's like, you know, if you're, you got your camera and you're a senior in high school, there is a freshman who's like, okay, yeah, I'm trying to, I'm trying to do what you're doing. You know, somebody's yeah. always watching you. And so, I encourage you to stay in it. You're an artist today because you are making art, not because people are like paying for it. Yeah. And it's like, I think it's, I think sharing age is so helpful too sometimes because it like, it it just like lets you know, like creatively, like it's sort of like a lifelong commitment. I remember when I was like 20 thinking like, oh my gosh, if I'm not here at 30, I'm going to like die. And then I made 30. I'm like, oh my gosh. If I'm not here at 40 and like you just like keep going, but it's just like, no, because you have to like look at like what you've done over time and it just keeps getting better and better the longer you stay in it. And even myself, I will, you know, be at work and so I like have my, you know, my TV gig job and then I might have an exhibition coming up and people are still like sort of shocked because at one point they were doing art or they were had aspirations to be a director and then they get into, you know, making money, um, you know, working in film or they get something else or they start families and then they just stop doing it. And it's just like, that is so sad because I remember like when they started, they were so excited. Now, if you decide you don't want to do it anymore, that's different. But if you like have like decided to give up and it's sort of faded away, but you still like sort of have low key dreams of it, but you're not working on it. That is upsetting. And so it's just like so important to like keep people around. That's what, like we were saying, like only people that like our work we <laughs> want around because maybe you might not necessarily like the content, but like even just like that we're still in it, that we're still creating all the time whether it's for something commercial or not is so, 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 so important. I like have like two friends I'll talk to on Instagram all the time. They're like always making stuff and age isn't even like thought about, you know, and you just get to see them like navigate, like, okay, now they have like spouses, now they have kids, but they're still making. And it's so important to just stay in it. Like don't get out of it. Even here I am at this residency and there are folks here in their 60s, like a part of the residents that are still making, have been painting for like, you know, 30, 40, 50 years, exhibiting this whole time, sometimes not. One artist hadn't been doing it for a while and it's like getting back into it. You know, she like stopped, I think just like raise, she had like one more kid to like get up and out. And then like now they're back to it. And it's just like, it's so encouraging just to see folks still in it. Yeah. And I it's think- the lifestyle. It's a lifestyle, yes. And I think it's also important, I don't know about you, but I don't think I knew any artists growing up. Like someone who they had an art practice and they were like a career artist. I definitely saw like, you know, singers, like people who sang in the choir on Sunday. But after Sunday, mm-hmm. they would put it away. Yeah, you know? yeah. And I can remember like musicians at our church, it would be like controversy because they're like, so-and-so is going to go play for Janet Jackson on the road. <laughs> and it's like, yeah, because I'm pretty sure 
as beautiful as his version of Amazing Grace was this Sunday, I can hear it. that man is jamming. <laughs> and I think Janet Jackson probably heard that too. And, you know, the black church definitely has some of our best artists and they can remain there. I'm not saying if you're playing in church, or if you're doing anything at church to stop, but yeah, there's some really great art being made in the black church, but then people put it away on Sunday after yeah. Sunday. And yeah. so I do wonder, yeah, I do. I do wonder sometimes like, do we stifle some creativity there and some artistry? There's so many great singers too, right? That you know and love who probably started in the church. Like Whitney Houston is a great example of that. Yes. That came up one time, I remember, with American Idol, how maybe was it like Jennifer Hudson and Fantasia? Maybe, I don't know if they sung in the church, but they were talking about like how easy it probably is for them because they were used to singing in church. So they're used to singing in front of like large crowds. Yeah. It's probably like no big deal. It's a and great like, training. Oh, yeah. Well. Look at how that trains trains them. Yeah. Yeah. And even like I was watching this church in Chicago. I think it's called Fellowship. Their camera, they have like cranes and stuff in there. They have a whole. I'm like, is y'all camera team union? <laughs> y'all have like oh, cranes and camera like team at the all church. these like cameras and they're cutting back and forth. No, they did a whole like aerial pan over the like choir and it like came down and it like zoomed in and I'm just like wow like whoever's doing this like you can definitely work a news channel or like make like your own live thing and that's another thing about you know these art worlds these creative worlds like not everything has to be like for you know NBC you know or for the Museum of Contemporary Art like some of it can just be you know, for church or because you want to talk about the people who own the farms in your area just because you want to celebrate them. Like it yeah. is literally like every day. Art stuff is like every day. My my mother always says anything you can do out there in the world, you can do in the church for the Lord. Ooh, that's come true. Dances. I do have this. Come dancers, come poets, come singers. And then you have to sit through a whole program of people doing gospel poetry. I don't know if that's what I'm looking for, but if that's what you do, let God use you. Wherever your platform is, my point is, whether you're doing your art in church, you're doing your art at, some people, I love people that do their art in schools. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know, I that is not to be looked down upon, that is to be honored. The Absolutely. artist that is in the school, especially in Absolutely. the public school, whoop, a, a many blessings upon you because that is not an easy job. Yeah. It is a gift. It is a calling because when you do art in public school or in any school, but particularly in public school, you are dealing with your raw artists who are still being developed. And then people who are like, I'm not into this, but you're all in the same group usually. Yeah. Right. Cause once we get to like high school and college, we can kind of separate out and say, Oh, you're not interested in this. You won't be a part of this group. But that like kindergarten through eighth grade art. Yeah, it's important. Man, we got people who are like, this is all I think about. Can you can I show you my drawings? Miss Graham? Yeah. And you're like, yeah. absolutely. And then you got other people that are like, I'm gonna pass gas and whistle until you kick me out this room because I hate <laughs> you, Miss Graham. And you have to <laughs> work with all of them, right? Yeah. Yeah. They're all together. <laughs> <laughs> They're all together. <laughs> and so, yeah, the teaching artist, the artist in residence at the public school, I, I just have, I, I was a teaching artist for many years. So much love and respect. It is, it is, again, it's a calling from the, from the, from the heart. But yeah, yeah the, you are an artist. If you are practicing in a school and helping create new artists, you are definitely an artist. And then I also wonder about, there are people who, yeah. They kind of do their, what is it, like street? Would you call it like street art? Yeah, they're just like on the art, on the street making art. Yeah. For people, yeah. Very much so. Like, you know, you're like people busking, uh, people who do like public artwork, graffiti artwork. Oh, yeah, for sure. Yeah, it's all art. Public too. performance art, you know, whether yeah. you have a permit or not. Like, <laughs> listen, we are for the people. Yeah, again, so much love and respect. 
And then you got your people that are like, I'm seeing a background for Janet Jackson. Sis, yes. Love yeah. it. Great. There's jobs for everyone. Even even if you're like 60 and you're like, you know what? I've always wanted to do this. Come back. Return. Come back and do We're it. We're inviting you back. That's a yeah, nice speech please. that I'm writing. Really? Calling people back to, the, to your art. Because I believe you're born an artist. I really do. There's so many artists that like I've found, I think like Kirstie Alley, didn't she? She like started acting really late. Uh, Vera Wang, I believe like started oh, making yeah. dresses was, in her like 40s. 40s. Yeah, she was an ice skater. I Julia think. Child. Mm. There's just so much. I tell my dad all the time because I got into film through my father and he knows lots of movies and stuff. I'm like, dad, take a writing class. You don't know. You might have a film in you. Yes. And we'll make it. Yes. And we, we, you never know who it's going to inspire, entertain. Yeah. It's just, yeah. And I, I, sometimes I wonder, and I appreciate critics. I do wonder where critics come from. Mm-hmm. And I wonder, are they frustrated artists? I wonder. I don't know. Listen, I don't know. I love critics too. You know, I would, there was a podcast I listened to and I was, Telling the lady of this podcast, I can't think of the name of it right now, though. I'll put it in the show notes. But I was writing her and I was like, people need to know. I think critics actually are important to be able like to guide conversation around culture and themes and stuff. But I do think that, yeah, I do wonder, too, like if there's someone who's given up. But also, I think it's also like another way to participate in in culture and creativity. There should be more. I don't think there... Are there are there comedy critics? Are there people that say, hey, I went to see Christina Anthony perform and this is what I thought of her set? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. And and, and people go to them sort of like a Roger Ebert of comedy critic? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Oh, and wow. they're published in, um, you know, the, in the trades, like Hollywood oh, okay. Reporter. Oh, really? The, okay. Vulture is a big one for comedy. Oh, okay. The, mm, the, on- the AV Club, Onion. The AV club. Oh, okay. Yeah. The Onion is funny. Yeah. Yeah. They do a lot of live re- oh. reviews of live performance work. Oh, interesting. Okay. Yeah. And I think similar to like theater reviews and then television shows now, there are some, they have criticism. They have like week by week recaps, but they also have criticism sure. of each episode. I think once the show becomes, uh, that's how you become critically acclaimed when people have very strong opinions about it. Um, Mm. but yeah, but you're right though. Like, I don't know. I think, you know, right now, like when I was starting in art, people always want to like put me in a box, like, oh, Hey, you can only do commercial photography. You can't do like fine art photography. You can only do this. You can only do that, blah, blah, blah. But now I feel like as I start to meet more artists and artists become my friends, like I have so many art friends that do like everything. And I do have some that they will write critiques on art projects and I think I would actually rather hear from them more so than like you know if it's going to be like a critic that's just like always talking about people if they're talking about them negatively especially like I rather hear from like somebody who's like in the mix doing it all the time too yeah and Uh, your peer review peer review peer review I love that you can also (laughs) make art that's not to be criticized I mean I guess people can seek it out but (laughs) <laughs> yeah, I just wonder, my point, my question about critics was, are critics, because you have to have a certain amount of knowledge about the thing you're criticizing. Yeah. So were you a photography major? Were you an acting major? Yeah. To have this deep knowledge? Or, yeah, or it was it like history of theater, history of journalism, history of... Yeah, you know, whatever uh, history yeah. of nonfiction. Like, how does that happen? Yeah, I would think you have to have some sort of background or like you've watched a lot of stuff. So yeah. you formed an opinion and then go from there. Yeah. Or is there like, w- if we really dug deep, would we find a film starring Roger Ebert being a terrible actor when he was 18? Yeah. <laughs> Maybe. Or killing it. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. Killing it. You know, sometimes some of the stuff, too, I think, especially like as I've, you know, moved forward to film, like I'm like, 
out to like young folks or anybody that's interested in movies or art, like figure out the kind of lifestyle you want, especially in film, I'll say this, figure out the kind of lifestyle you want and then the job after that, like the job that will fit that. And so I wonder, I say all that because I'm like, I wonder if a critic, maybe Roger's like, you know what? I don't got time to be on set all day. It's cold out here. Ooh. I'm going to go back home. I'm going to go. But I do have opinions. And I can't mm-hmm. on Sunday while the kids are asleep go to the movie theater with my wife. <laughs> and then after dinner while they are watching the movie, I can write about this. So oh, while wow, they're watching movies at home. And yeah, okay. Yeah, he Maybe. went by himself. And then he went by himself while the kids are napping. Okay. And then he came home for dinner with the family. And then the wife took the kids to have a snack while he worked, a movie and snack while he worked. Oh, wow. I don't know if that's true, but that's what I, that's how I decided that's how he became a critic. And that's how people become critics because they say, hey, I don't want this life. And I think it's probably better that I make my own schedule. No, I, that's, (laughs) I disagree. I believe that people become (laughs) critics because somebody was like, look, mom, I took this picture. And then the mother was like, I hate this picture. And for you at home, I'm ripping an imaginary picture up straight down the middle. It's huge poster size. And then the person runs off and they're like, ah. And the next thing you know, they're at school. They're on the table. They're like, you know what? School sucks. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Oh, my gosh. I just love it. Oh, my gosh. But you our know- point is stay in the game. Yep. Please stay in it. Who's your fan base? Who's listening? You know what? Who listens to the Nosy AF is a bunch of creatives. They are artists. Uh, They are activists and they are independent like business owners, like small business owners. Oh, love that. That are just out here. You know, they're interested in culture. They're interested in foolishness and... They know how I'm curious. And so they're curious about what I'm curious about. Like, they're like, yeah, I'll learn about that. Sure. Oh, love that. I love a curious yeah. mind. Yeah. And, you know, as this project develops, I, I'm always like learning more about it. You know, as I'm like, okay, this is who I want to know because I feel like I'd be asking these questions anyway. Like, I feel like we'd be having this conversation anyway. And so I'm like, let me record it, you know, and then see what becomes of it. So like as I like make it more of a serious podcast and you have to like fine tune the niche and all that kind of stuff, like, yeah, I'm always learning about who I want to have. But I feel like talking to almost anybody that will talk to me has been really helpful. But people who I'm curious about, not just like anyone, anyone. Right. You know. Well, you know what they say, be interested, not interesting. That's right. That's right. Yeah. It sounds like you're accomplishing that. Yeah, I think so. And I'm really happy that you came to talk to me today. Do you think there's anything we should talk about before we call our conversation complete? No, I just, I want to, I'm very curious about this theme song, you know. Oh, it's instrumental. It's, it's, it's really, yeah. It's like a, yeah, it's instrumental. You know, we keep it real hip hop around here because hip hop is also a lifestyle. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And uh, you sounded yeah, like so. a white executive from Nike, but sure. <laughs> okay. You guys, I need to tell you something. I am a white executive. <laughs> well, they've never seen you. No. <laughs> Your audience no, has never be seen amazing. you. No. <laughs> <laughs> because my new cover art is an uh, illustration <laughs> of a woman you admire. <laughs> yes. <laughs> oh, my gosh. I love it. Oh There's gosh. probably a white Stephanie Graham before we go. You know, at one point in my career, I became. Oh, there definitely is a white Stephanie Graham. Okay. And you I'm going to shout her. About no, this. there is. And I, let me tell you, she's also an artist. Okay. String and bones. And I have one of her artworks at home. I bought one. Okay. So that's very supportive of you. It there was. is another Christina Anthony. I am not supportive. Let me tell you why though. So about 10, 10 years ago, no, probably 13 years ago when I first mm-hmm. moved to L.A. So that was like 2010, 2011. Someone reached out to me and they're like, I'm trying to be friends with all the Christina Anthony's on Facebook. 
And for those of you that don't know, because I know this is a younger crowd, Facebook is a social media platform Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. that older (laughs) people use to keep in touch. And so, yeah, yeah, so she was, this is about 13 years ago. So she was like, hey, my name is Christina Anthony. I'm trying to be friends with everybody who's Christina Anthony. Now, mind you, I have just moved to Los Angeles. I am sleeping on an air mattress in the hood, you know, got a hand-me-down car, but I'm really struggling. And I, I'm i like, why would I want to be friends with these people? I go ahead and join the group. One Christina Anthony is an Indian doctor, pretty much pretty sure she has already found the cure for cancer. She was pretty close 13 years ago. Wow. Another Christina Anthony was a meteorologist. You know, she's like, I'm just getting started, but I'm going to be doing the weather. Thanks, guys. Another Christina Anthony was an actress. And she was killing the game. She's like, I have two kids and a dog. She lived in like Denmark or something. Uh Uh-huh. And she was like, and guys, I have a play this weekend that I'm in. And I would watch this woman seething. Just like... (laughs) God, how could you? God, my God, can you hear me? I'm the Christina Anthony that's the actress. Why would you give her? And she like a little dog. And then the husband brought her like some flowers for her play. And I was like, what are you doing? You gave the acting Christina Anthony life with the cute kids and the husband. I don't like dogs. I am not a dog person, but you gave her the dog. She seems to enjoy it. You gave it to the wrong person. You gave it to white Christina Anthony in Denmark. It's me. It's for me, black Christina Anthony, <laughs> struggling here on this air mattress. Do you hear me? Oh, Lord. That's yeah. what years later, it all worked out for me. But at that time, Praise the Lord, <laughs> I was not in a good place. But I love to hear that you were supportive of the other Stephanie Graham. Yeah, I mean, she didn't buy one of my artworks and she's always welcome to. And it wasn't like I wasn't it wasn't like an exchange. I just thought it was sort of wild. And I liked I liked the um, the artwork. But there is also I became Miss Graham.com because Stephanie Graham.com was taken. Ooh. And now and it was a graphic designer at the time. Ooh. Now Stephanie Graham.com is available, but it's like twelve hundred dollars. Yeah, and there Oof. was a point. There Oof. was a point when it was, I feel like, eight hundred. And now I wish I would have just been like, just buy it, just buy it. Yeah, I wish I had eight hundred dollars. Yeah, I wish I had bought ChristinaAnthony.com. dot com. It it wasn't available, and then it became available, and it it it, it was still out of my reach though because I was struggling. Yeah, it definitely wasn't even twelve hundred, but it was out of my reach. I was struggling, and then now I think recently I tried to look at it, and they wanted like tens of thousands of dollars but i was like um you're not gonna get me i've worked too hard i'm not paying this kind of money i will be christina anthony online biz dot world if i have to yeah because i'm not gonna pay for my own name right i know it's i know sometimes i think like oh maybe i could think of some sort of fun activity to like raise the money for it but i'm also like miss graham.com is wonderful and it's been with me since college yeah I, I think it's great. Yeah, whatever. And these days you can find people. Also, guess what? You need a U.S. post office or a UPS box anyway. Have your mailing address, artist. Yeah. Have a non-digital way for people to find you, contact you, send you paper checks. Oh, my gosh. I was just thinking I should get like a uh, virtual address. There was a girl on Instagram I follow who was telling her, you're like, yo, shout out, get a virtual address. And I'm like, you know, that's a good idea. I should look into it. And as as I've been up here, I've been like redesigning the Nosy AF website. And not that anybody's asked to send me packages, but I was like, maybe I can put my virtual address on here. And then, you know, for like giftings or sponsorships, I can, that's where they can send everything. It's nice to have. It's I use it. I use mine. It's nice to have. It's also nice to have when someone's, yeah, is like, I want to send you something. And I'm like, I don't really know you. So I don't want to tell you about my home. But <laughs> you yeah. seem like a nice person. Yeah, it's nice for people to be able to send. And also when you're like, if you're not around, it's nice to just have a place that can catch packages for you and letters. Yeah. You know what, though? I know some people, uber famous people, they have an address for fan mail. 
Oh, where people okay. can send you like drawings of yourself, letters. Yeah, you know, just or like, you know, they made I made a doll with your head on it, which could feel weird, but they have they want to send that stuff. Now you know when uh, I was on ABC's Mixed Dish, which is still now, they don't still need available. to send any be a doll <laughs> with my head on it. Yeah, but that's for being really <laughs> famous. I will say this: when I was on Mixed Dish on ABC, which is still available on Hulu, if you want to check it out, you guys. Very um, funny. When I was on that show, you know, they would come around on Fridays with the fan mail. Yeah. Because people, people would write in. We had Mark Paul Gossler, who was on Saved by the Bell. Zach Morris. Right. So he'd get his fan so mail. So cool. Tika Sumter from the Have and the Have Nods, obviously. And the Sonic movies, very famous actress. And then the kids, they were building up their following, too. Do you know, in 36 episodes of television, two years of being on that show, I got one piece of fan mail. And it was from a young person in prison. But I will say, and it wasn't even a whole letter. It was just he had ripped it off of a page of something else. Wow. But I thought to myself, what if I had not been at work when he sent this letter? I could have used a real address. So I went out and got a mailbox that way. And I know for people who might be listening, they're like, well, ma'am, you don't seem to have a following. (laughs) (laughs) Well, ma'am. You don't seem to have a following, but I'm saying, please get yourself an address, a physical address that you feel safe and comfortable sharing with people that isn't your home. You can write it off. Yeah, you can. And I'm going to get one. And people. Great. Yeah. No, that's a great tip. Thank you. Yeah. And I hope to get my second piece of fan mail one day. Yes, maybe from someone on the show. You got to start somewhere. I guess. You yeah, absolutely start somewhere. you do. That's right. So for all the artists who we've encouraged on this call, please get yourself an, a mailing address yes. that you feel comfortable sharing. We can get one together. Maybe we can get a going on a group deal or something. Stay yeah. tuned for updates on that. Because you never know when a prisoner might want to reach out to you. I think that's yeah. a great place to end it. I think so. You Thank think you. You like this. I love it. Thank you so much for tuning into the Nosy AF podcast with me, your host, your friend, Stephanie Graham. I'm so glad that you made it to the end of this conversation. Please kindly let me know what you thought by leaving a rating and review on Apple Podcasts, on Spotify, Stitcher, wherever you're listening right now. You can also connect with me at nosyaf.com via the Say Hello button. And if you're curious about what's going on in my art and film life, please visit my website at missgram.com. Oh, and also, if there is someone that you're nosy about and you want me to have them on the show, please send suggestions via the same hello button and I will check them out. Until next time, thank you so much for being you and see you soon. Peace.